So, today, we're going to be in Genesis 10. We're going to try and get through the whole chapter. That's my goal. There's a lot of slides, but uh, some of them are just straight photos, but a lot of them are densely packed information. So, the Table of Nations in Genesis 10 is a genealogy. So, let's review genealogies, because we've only covered one in Genesis 5 thus far. First off, never skip them. Okay, because if I, if I find out you can skip a genealogies, child, I will come at you like a lion. Okay, don't ever, ever skip genealogies. They are important for understanding the narrative flow of biblical books. Their inclusion is normally designed to summarize a lot of information and then move on with the story. A lot of time, a lot of details that just get summarized and then boom, you're moving on. I liken them to a previously on from your favorite episode of TV. You've come back last, from last week and previously on the Genesis prologue. We have had the story of Noah and his three sons have come through the flood along with their wives. And now it's time to multiply again, fulfilling the Noahic covenant blessings that are repeated from creation. So this summary is trying to say, hey, God said be fruitful and multiply, not only in creation, but in recreation. This is how that happened. Let's summarize it, put everybody in their place, and then move on with the real story of Genesis. But if you skip this genealogy, you will be confused in the details later on about why Genesis is doing what it's doing. Usually, it's about where the, the genealogies end up. The end of the genealogies is typically the reason why it's there. So as we go through today's, we should ask ourselves certain questions about why it ends the way that it ends, as well as why it's constructed throughout the way it's constructed. So Genesis 10 is slightly different from other biblical genealogy. A lot of genealogies tend to go person to person, father to son or father to grandson, you know, anything like that. So Gen Genesis 10 is not one genealogy, it's three genealogies. That's a slight difference from most other genealogies in the Bible. It names not merely individuals from certain generations, it names whole people groups that descended from them. So typically it's going to go individual to individual to individual in most genealogies. Here, however, it's going to summarize, hey, this people group came from this son of Noah, which is distinct. I don't think there are any other genealogies in the Bible that typically do that. If they do, it's certainly not to the extent that this is. So it, it gets called the table of nations because it's not really a genealogy about individuals. It's about the descendants of the people groups that came from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So the table of nations ends with all the known nations living in their territories during the rest of biblical history, not at the time of Shem, Ham, and Japheth themselves. So it, it, this is a good visual aid here. You get the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then highlighted here is the territories of where their people groups are going to eventually move out to. And I say eventually in the time of like from say, Moses around 1400 B.C. down to about the exile around 500 B.C. Let's just go to the end of the exile. Uh, so about 15, 1600 years of biblical Old Testament time frame and where these people groups, clans, tribes, and nations are going to end up or be in the minds of the ancient world. And that's important. This is not an extensive and exhaustive list. This is supposed to be putting everybody on a map in their general areas. So I, I will use this map, shorten it, cut it around uh, as we go through Japheth, Ham, and Shem's genealogies here for their people groups. But the first thing I want you to notice is, is this. Uh, you can see there, there, there is overlap between their peoples, obviously. But the place where all three of them overlap is Israel. God knew what he was doing when he gave this little strip of land to be in the center of all the nations. 
all 70 of these people groups that are going to be counted here center in the Mediterranean world right here. When God says, Abraham, leave your place all the way over here and go to the land that I will show you later on in Genesis, he leads him to the very center of all the nations. Gee, I wonder if there's a purpose to that. Geographically speaking, the way that they conceived the world, and we've been talking with Noah about the known world, this little flat disk floating on the water's mini continent that they perceived the planet to be because they didn't have a concept of the planet, was all of this space right here. So where do they get the, the 70 nations expanding to? Across the, the literal planet? No, across the flat disk that they understood the world to be, which is the Mediterranean world extending all around here from the Fertile Crescent on down through North Africa to Spain, Tarshish, and then back again. And where was the center point? Because, look, everything over here is desert. Everything over here is fertile. Everything over here is fertile. And everything over here is fertile. So if you want to avoid the chaotic Mediterranean oceans and the dangers of actually sailing that, you were going to go around through land. So if you wanted to go from over here to over here, your most likely safest bet was to actually go through Israel. God puts them there for a reason. You are to be a light to all the nations. And where you're at geographically is not only a plentiful place the way Eden was, it is actually forcing your interaction with the ancient world because you don't hop on a plane and go over the Mediterranean. You either get on a boat and risk capsizing and dying at sea, or most people just went around. So God knows what he's doing here. And this is setting up for what God is later going to do. So the purpose of the table of nations, is multifaceted. It is to give a complete list of the nations, but not a complete meaning exhaustive list. The author is going to count to 70. 70 nations that descend from Noah's three sons and where they are geographically located later in time. That is, hello Logan, that is the fundamental point going on here in the table of nations. Within the Genesis narratives, the table of 70 nations counted here in Genesis 10, they link all of humanity together thematically. The, all the ancient Near Eastern world and in their minds, humanity is linked together here before God is going to divide them up at Babel in chapter 11. So he's giving you the post-Babel world before Babel so that he can link humanity together even before they're separated. Uh, then he zeroes in on Shem's bloodline through a descendant of Shem Peleg, who will come up in, these, in chapter 10. And, and his link, his zeroing in from Shem's bloodline, happens after Babel. We will get mention of Peleg here, and then he will get ignored until after Babel. Then he will come back, and he will show you Peleg's descendants down to Abraham, out of whom will come God's own nation, Israel, whom he will plant in the center of the nation. Israel is the nation he creates for the recovery and the redemption of all the other nations and all the other people groups counted in this 70. We'll talk about why 70 in just a minute. But 70 is the number that, uh, of the people groups that we get in chapter 10, and no more. But obviously more nations existed, so what is he doing? There. Well, 70 is an umbrella term for all people. It is an ancient Near Eastern way of reckoning everyone and everything without actually listing them exhaustively. Why can't you list them exhaustively? Lots of reasons. Uh, 70 is meant to convey, or it's one way that you could convey, totality, completeness. By being a multiple of seven, a singular number for completeness, multiply it by 10. And when you're dealing in large scales nationalities, in large scale geographic areas, you can't just write every little detail down. You don't have enough paper. It was too expensive. You don't have enough time. Somebody's going to have to come along and rewrite everything that you say eventually because the papyrus that you're writing on in your desert arid climate is eventually going to crumble and turn to dust. 
So somebody is going to literally be writing down an exhaustive list of the nations. That's all they're going to do all their days. So they find shorthand ways of encompassing this. The purpose of the Table of Nations is not to give an exhaustive count of all people groups on earth. It is also not to argue, hey, there's only 70 people on this world. On the land, there exists 70. Now, there are no more, <laughs> right? Uh, that's just silly, okay? The author counts to 70, and then he stops, knowing that there are more people that he could include by name. But they are included under the umbrella idea of 70, representing all and every nations. Complete does not need to mean exhaustive. If you stop and think about it, you realize no author ever speaks or teaches exhaustively everything that he could. No writer ever writes down exhaustively every little detail that could be written about any subject matter. It's not actually possible. You have to go all the way back to what we talked about at the beginning of this year with, with Biblical Basics for Beginners. You have to discriminate. You have to decide, I'm going to talk about this much, I'm going to prioritize what I'm going to talk about, and then I'm not going to talk about other things. Here, they count to 70. They said, okay, good enough. Now you get the point. All the people groups that we are aware of, that we know of, that are out there, but not exhaustively out there. You know, all doesn't mean all. Exactly the same thing that we've talked about with uh, Noah. He's doing something very similar to that. Nations known to Israel but not mentioned in his grouping are nations like Israel who don't exist yet. Neither do Moab or the Edomites because we're not there in the story yet. But obviously, even in Genesis 10, when you're talking about nations that eventually descend from them, you could talk about Israel, Moab, the Edomites, but they don't. He's trying to get to precisely 70 because in the ancient Near Eastern world, they understand 70 as a number for the completion and totality of nations. In the pre-Greek world, right, the Greeks were the ones who, who started to think more exactly, less in round numbers and more in exact notions. They're a thousand years away from it at this point in the story. But, but through Alexander conquering and bringing Greek education, numbers tend to get more exact. So this ancient world, ancient Near Eastern world before that, doesn't care about being exact. And you're going to have to understand 70 on their terms. It is a conceptual number for 7 multiplied by 10 for describing that completeness and totality and then moving on. Okay. They don't have the ability to copy and paste whole list of peoples and easily print them out endlessly with a printer. Everything is being copied by hand. So everything uh, that the scribes write, they find ways to, to encompass shorthand. 70 is a shorthand for all nations and all people groups. Even the ones that don't specifically or may not specifically descend from Noah. Let's say that the flood encompassed the known world, but that before Noah's flood, people moved to Asia, Australia, Russia, maybe even across the gaps of the Arctic in, into North America and South America. Before the flood even happened, they would be descendants of Adam, but not necessarily descendants of Noah. They would be conceptually thought of in this 70 group, okay? The Bible does this all the time with numbers between 7, 10, equaling 70. Or, or just, it starts with numbers in 7, and then it'll expand it out in multiples of 10. So first off, a week is a 7-day cycle. A completed week is kind of the fundamental idea that this all starts with. So 7 becomes a number of a com of, for completion based primarily on the fact that God creates in one week. That's the starting point. Then you, you start having to count larger and larger numbers. And so you get to 70 as a multiple of 7. And you get ideas like Judges 8.30 where Gideon has 70 sons. Now, I don't think that means he actually has 70 sons because part of the conceptualization is that El, the high god of the Ugaritic pantheon, Ugar Ugaritic being Israel's neighbors directly to the north, 
El had 70 sons with his wife, which was a way of connoting El is God of all. He is the high transcendent God. Bel is his immediate representative on earth, the highest of his 70 sons. But 70 meaning El has complete sovereign political dominion of the earth. So the Bible takes this exact picture and applies it to Gideon because Gideon, who's also named um, Jerel Baal, so you get the name Baal uh, attached to his name, because he's turning pagan. He turns into a king in all but name. He rejects the title of king, but basically the story is trying to paint him as pagan as possible by the end of his lifetime. And one way that they do that is to say he had 70 sons, which is not an exact numeric count, nor is it meant to be. And it's not the only one. All sorts of other places do this. Job had seven sons and three daughters. So 10 kids. Or at least that's a description for his totality of blessing. But it's not the only description. He has 7,000 sheep and 3,000, uh, sorry, it's, yeah, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, meaning 10,000 animals. But does he literally have 7,000 sheep, no more, no less, you know, uh, 3,000 camels? No, it's, an, it's doing the same thing. Seven sons, three daughters, multiples. And then it multiplies it out of saying, hey, he's got as many, he's got the perfect blessings. He's got everything in life that you could possibly imagine or want. He's the richest guy in the world and he deserves everything because he's been obedient to God. That's the prologue of Job, right before God comes along and takes it all away. You do not need to count this as being an exact numerical number, even his children. You, you can mean that, but it doesn't absolutely have to. You want to read literarily, not literally. And out of that, you will find the literal point. No matter how many exact number of kids Job had, he was considered to have the perfect family, the perfect numerical number of blessings. And then it changes the literary device by saying he has 500 oxen and 500 donkeys. I mean, oxen and donkeys were more rare. They were rarer and they were more valuable. So the fact that he would have less in comparison to sheep can be represented by saying 500 as opposed to 700 and 300. If you think like an ancient, this is pretty easy stuff. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Did he literally sleep with a thousand women? No, because that's not the point. If you view that statement in verse 3, 1 Kings 11, 3, 700 wives and three concubines, in the context of the six verses that surround it, where he's, he's describing, hey, Solomon, a lot like Job, had everything that you could ever want. He was the most blessed, richest, riches, richest, most powerful king that had ever come up to this point in history. And he had all the women that you could possibly imagine a, an ancient Near Eastern king wanting. That's all he's trying to say. Oh, by the way, all of that stuff led him astray and corrupted him, and he was just destroyed. So it's an exaggerated literary device. It's not an exact numerical count. It's the same thing going on in the Table of Nations. It's not 70, meaning 70 and only 70. It's a numerical device for totality and completion. In the New Testament, the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem was called the Sanhedrin, which meant 70. It was a term related to 70, and it had 70 members. The Septuagint, LXX, Roman count, L for 50, X10, X10, 50, 10, 10, 70. The Septuagint was said to have been translated the Old Testament Hebrew Greek, uh, the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek by 70 translators. That's why it gets its name. But it's conceptually related to, hey, we want the, the Hebrew scriptures to be readable by all of the nations. Greek had become the lingua franca of the day. The common language was Koine Greek, common Greek, Koine for common, right? Uh, so they translate it with 70 translators, and they establish a ruling council of 70 people because they're conceiving themselves as representing all of Israel and Israel representing all the nations. These are all linked ideas, and they come from places like Genesis 10. So let's read some of Genesis 10 and start diving into 
what the author is getting at in 70 times 10. Sorry, 7 times 10 to get 70. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yavin, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rephath, Togermah. The sons of Yavin, Elisha, Tarshish, the Kittites, and the Rodanites. So there he starts getting not people, but people groups. Not a person or individuals, but a group of people that descend from Yavin. Okay? From these, the maritime peoples spread out into their territories by their clans within the nations, each with their own language. That, that, that's an important point because we haven't gotten to Babel yet. So he's reflecting back on uh, something that hasn't even happened yet in chapter 10. All right, so let's just break down that much. Five verses. The descendants of Japheth. First, verse 1, this is the third Toledot, the accounting, uh, out of ten in the book of Genesis. I've mentioned this several times already, and I'll keep mentioning it every time we get to a Toledot. Toledot has ten, Genesis has ten subdivisions to it. I wonder if that's important, because the number of ten is, a, is an important number in the Bible. The third of the accountings, because Toledot means accountings, is here in the Table of Nations. So just pay attention to that. He's subdividing his book. Verse 2, seven sons are mentioned. So he's giving you one set of seven, and then he gives you, in verses 3 and 4, seven grandsons mentioned. Three by Gomer, four by Yavin. That's a second set of seven. So 70 will be ten sets of seven. Now, the table of nations does not fall evenly between that. They don't all just count to ten, or here two sets of seven, which would be 14, right? Uh, it's not going to be that clear cut, but it's an introductory grouping designed to clue the reader in to how the whole table is supposed to be understood, which is this. Multiples of seven are likely to be important. They may not be the only way that they're communicated, but your general conclusions should be based on multiples of seven. That would be obvious to the ancient world. They counted to seven a lot. They used multiples of seven a lot. So that would immediately tip off your ancient mind to saying, oh, seven sons and seven grandsons. I wonder how I should read the rest of this table and the complete table together. I'm probably going to use multiples of seven. So we're going to keep that in mind as we go through the table of nations, okay? Verse 5 expressly states that more peoples are descending from Japheth. More maritime people are kind of summarized in mentions, and they're spreading out, but the author is not concerned with counting them. Yes, they count in the sense that they're legitimate nations out there, but they don't count to 70. They're included in the umbrella term, move on. He only establishes two sets of seven for 14 people groups descended from Japheth, which he with his pattern of seven established, he will proceed with less concern with numerical details. So he, he's clued his readers in. His ancient Near Eastern readers would pick up on this, and then it doesn't have to stay with the pattern the whole time because it's going to get to 70, and they're, they're going to pick up on that. Okay? So Japheth's descendants are the ones who move up here. So this is going to be the fur furthest north, according to another map. So Japheth's descendants, the furthest north, the furthest northwest, the furthest northeast. They're just not just going straight up, but they're going up and out, right? So they live in the most remote locations away from Israel. And Israel and the surrounding immediate territories where most of the biblical narratives are going to take place. What does this mean? It means Japheth's descendants will become less important for the Old Testament. That's pretty much the only thing I want you to pick up on. Uh, Shem and Ham's descendants are the primary players in the table of, from the Table of Nations. You should, you'll, you'll pay more attention to them as the Old Testament goes on. One exception to this, if you chart the geographical importance. Verse 5, this mention of the maritime people. These people that will sail the Mediterranean and other oceans, right? The Hebrews didn't do that. 
They feared the chaotic ocean. Uh, but these people are going to move further and further westward, and s- likely some will refer to the Greeks and the Romans, known in the intertestamental and the New Testament time. Yavin, if you trace this down in more details, the descendants of Yavin were the, would most likely be the Greeks that founded their cultures in the Aegean Sea. Troy, the, Itis, the, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, all of these cultural groups that you're familiar with and that you learn about in here are descending most likely from Yavin, who is a descendant of Japheth. Tyrus, those people uh, are most likely to be the Etruscans who started in Lydia, but then migrated to Italy in the 8th century BC and most likely are the Romans by descent. They established Rome through, the story goes, Romulus and Remus. So they come up later. In the intertestamental period, the descendants of Japheth make their way back eastward through the conquest of Alexander the Great and later through Rome's dominance of Israel. They show up again, but they won't be overly important for the Old Testament, but they are pretty important by the time you get to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, God starts reclaiming these 70 nations. We'll get there. All right. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Siba, Havila, Sabta, Rayama, and Septica. The sons of Rema, Sheba, and Didan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna in Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kela, and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kela, which is the great city. Why would he insert any of that? We'll get there. Mitzrayim was the father of the Ludites, Anamites, Lehabites, Nephtahites, Pathrasites, Kazlahites, from whom came the Philistines, and Kaphtarites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvadites, Zamra- Zamarites, rather, and the Hamathites. Later, the Canaanite clan scattered, and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon toward Gerar, as far as Gaza, and then towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Edema, and Zeboim, as far as Laash. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. Let's break this down a little bit, because there are some very important details here that Genesis is setting up. The descendants of Ham start with verse 4. He mentions four sons of Ham, but then he starts breaking in verse 7. You, you get... Four four sons ignore Put. Put doesn't get any uh, descendants counted here. But you get divisions of seven again. Cush has five sons and two grandsons get get mentioned. Let me get the numbers right on my fingers. Uh, Which is a counting of seven sons of Cush. Wonder if that's important. Plus one, Nimrod. So he, he sets up a pattern of seven and then he immediately breaks the pattern. And verses 8 through 12, and then in verses 13 through 14, Mitzrayim, which is the Hebrew word for Egypt. So a lot of your Bibles will just translate this straight to Egypt, which is fine. This is Egyptian people here. Egypt gets seven peoples mentioned, reestablishing the pattern of seven. So he goes seven plus one, seven again. So he's, he's telegraphing something here about his continual pattern. And then in verse uh, 15 through 18a, Canaan the cursed, which we talked about last week, cursed be Canaan, a lowest and slay. He has 11 peoples descend from him. 18b through 19, their territory is geographically marked from the Mediterranean coast on the west. So furthest west that you can go on the map in the land of Canaan. And then it starts mapping out from the north to the south, and then it moves to the interior uh, all, all the way to the to the east, and it get, gets, again goes from north to south. It just encompasses the whole land of Canaan. 
geographically in verses 18b and 19. These are the peoples in the territory that Israel will conquer and drive out in the conquest through Joshua. If you're a good Jew, you already know that story. You have the book of Joshua and you've been familiar with it. Here, Genesis is introducing it in this format. Verse 14, ignore the Philistines. They don't count in this numerical counting of seven. If you counted the Philistines, you would get 71, not 72 nations. Why do you ignore the Philistines? One, uh, possibly they uh, added the Philistines in there later. They weren't a part of the original manuscripts. Uh, or likely they're being counted on the umbrella term of the, the Caslophites by the name they were called later on. So he's, he's like saying, hey, you know, the Philistines, they were an off branch of the Caslophites. I think that's probably more accurately what's going on here. By then, they knew them as a different name, so they're, they're including two names of the same people. So you don't count the Philistines in the numerical counting of Ham. That's all I'm saying. With the inclusion of Nimrod and the exclusion of the Philistines, 30 peoples are mentioned as descending from Ham. With Jephthah's 14 people and Ham's 30 people, that's 44 out of 70 thus far. So that's a broad overview of Ham's area. And here you get Mitzrayim, and it's located where? Egypt, because that's just the Hebrew word for Egypt. And so Ham is kind of taking all this territory all the way down to here, right? All the way across North Africa. But notice over here in green from this picture, that was Shem's territory, right? But it gave you this details about some guy named Nimrod. And it told you where he built his kingdoms. And where was that? So Nimrod is the Hebrew word for rebel. Is that a good thing in, thus far in the book of Genesis, to be a rebel? No. So it's likely a derogatory title for a villain more than a historic name. Verses 8 and 9 say he was a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Okay, what does that have to do with anything? Because you often see pictures like this where he's covered in fur, got a weapon, conquering a lion or something. Hunting was an ancient Near Eastern idiom for conquering. We talked about idioms last week. It's an expression or it's a phrase. If Nimrod itself is kind of an expression or a phrase for saying he's the bad guy, you would expect the idea that he's a hunter to be another form of trying to say he's a conqueror. He sets out to conquer new lands and new peoples. Was there any evidence that this is what he's doing and that we should read hunter as an idiom for conqueror? The answer is yes. Verses 10 through 12 say he conquered this land. So the picture in verses 8 through 12 is that Nimrod is in rebellion against God and he's the progenitor, the beginner, of all these major empires that would later oppose God's people in the Old Testament, who would set themselves up as the cosmic rebels and adversaries by their own imperial power, propaganda, and strength, and their pagan culture, they would set themselves against Yahweh and against his people. Because if you look at the kingdoms that he built, the two major ones that stand out, verse 10 associates him with the building of Babylon. Babylon exiled the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 BC. At least that was the third of their exiles and certainly the most devastating of it. But also in verse 11, he's associated with building the kingdom of Assyria and all the surrounding territories there. Why would that matter? Because Assyria was the kingdom and the empire that exiled the north, the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC. But, you know, 150 years ish before the southern kingdom is exiled by Babylon, the enemies of God in Assyria come down and crush the northern kingdoms. Hmm. And if you're reading your Old Testament clearly and closely, in places like Isaiah chapters 13 and 14, or Micah 5, 6, Babylon and Assyria can be portrayed as cosmic enemies. The way that Rome is God's cosmic enemy in the New Testament. Before that, 
before Rome became the imperial power of the day, Babylon, Assyria, Persia to a lesser extent, uh, they get portrayed as the enemies of God. And that the pagan powers that animate these people, these conquerors, these warriors, the pagan gods are at war with Yahweh. Even Egypt gets point painted this way in Exodus. And here you're getting the seed form of where they came from. Where did God's cosmic enemies come from? One rebel in the past decided he was going to go conquer a bunch of lands and set up his own kingdom. But note the geography. Nimrod is conquering lands way over here. But he's coming for, as a descendant of Ham. Ham's territory is like way over here. This, this map is a little bit misleading because a lot of this territory is Shem's as well. Okay, don't take it exactly. And a lot of Japheth's territory is actually way over here, not over here. But I'm using it to try and make a point. This, this arrow is trying to point you where they're uh, expanding to. But over here, kind of where they all overlapped from these other pictures that I've shown you before. Babylon and Assyria are over here. So where is Nimrod going? As a descendant of Ham from over here, where is he going to build his kingdoms? Shem's territory. What nation comes from Shem? Israel. Where does he go to build his territory? Over here where Babylon is. Who comes out of the Babylonian era and territory? Abraham does. These are all tied together. And where does God plant his people, Israel? In Ham's territory, in the land of Canaan, who's cursed and made the lowest of all the sons of Noah, all of their descendants. It's, it's as if God is saying, all right, fine, you want to rebel against me and establish your own kingdoms? You want to wage war against me? I will fight you back and I will invade your territory. You invade my territory, I will invade your territory. And I will set up my own kingdom underneath your very nose. And he does this pattern over and over and over again. You want, to, you want Babylon to conquer my kingdom? I will raise up a remnant in the middle of Babylon, and I will bring them back to my land, and I will establish them all. So when we come back to, to this map here, and you see all the overlap here in Israel, all of Ham's territory over here, where does Nimrod go? All of this area over here. Mesopotamia. And he builds his kingdom over here, outside of Ham's territory, in Shem's territory. He builds the cosmic kingdoms that would defy God. And so out of those cosmic kingdoms down here with uh, Ur, which is you know could be over here, it could be over here, depending on where you look. God is going to say, out of Ur, I call Abraham to come down here and invade Ham's territory in the worst place possible, Canaan's territory, the worst center possible of Ham's line. And there I'm going to build a new nation a new people group. And out of that people group, I'm going to invade all the other territories and build my own land. Here, you can see it over here. Uh, Ur, in this ca calendar, is way down here because the Persian Gulf would likely have come way up here. That's Ur, where Abraham is called out of. This is uh, Nineveh, Babylon. All this area and all this territory here in Mesopotamia is what Nimrod is conquering. In Shem's territory. So God is saying, fine, I'll bring someone out of here and I'll build my own nation and I'll beat you. Rebel all you want. You can't beat me, says the Lord. So all of this is being encompassed in, in little verses that most people skip over. And it sets up the narratives all throughout the rest of the Old Testament. All the way down to Revelation. God has cosmic enemies portrayed one way or another. This is where they're coming from. And then 21 through 31, the sons of Shem. Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arxphasad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hal, Gether, and Meshech. Arxphasad was the father of Shelah. Shelah was the father of Eber, who's already been mentioned. Why was he mentioned already? We'll get to that. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg, 
Because in his time, the earth was divided. His brother's name was Juktan. Juktan was the father of Olmadad, Shelef, Hazarmabath, Zerah, Hedoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Shiva, Orfer, Havila, and Jobab. You guys know Jobab? All of these were the sons of Juktan. The region where they lived stretched from Misha towards Safar uh, in the eastern hill country. These were the sons of Shem by their clans and languages and their territories and nations. These are the clans of Noah's sons, according to the lines of descent within the nations. From, the na from these, the nations spread out over the land after the flood. So he's closing it off there. So let's get through the sons of Shem as best we can here. Shem, we get the word Shemites, or in English, Semites, referring to all Semitic peoples, not just the Jews. We Often you hear about, and right now you're hearing a lot about, if you're watching the news, anti-Semitism. Because Hamas is attacking Israel. Hamas is the anti-Semitic people uh, who, who want death to Israel and death to America and all this stuff, right? But just because you're hearing anti-Semitism talked about in reference to the Jews, it's not strictly just to the Jews. All Semitic people count as uh, you can be anti-Semitical against any of them. Just wanted to point that out. Verse 21a. Is Shem or Japheth older? Because although in the NIV translation that I'm using here, uh, it says Shem was the younger brother of Japheth. Some translations will say Japheth, the younger brother of Shem, or Shem, the older brother of Japheth. Now, I think the textual evidence from the oldest manuscripts does, in fact, suggest Japheth is the oldest. So Shem would be the second son of Noah. Why is that important? Because if you follow, it, it would follow the pattern established in Genesis that is usually not going to be the literal firstborn son that God will grant covenant promises to, but it will be the second son or later. We talked about this last week with the firstborn rites, where Ham is violating his mother so that he can establish himself as a greater rank because he was at the bottom of the, the pecking order by his birth. Shem appears to be granted in Noah's blessing at the end of chapter 9 uh, the rights of the firstborn, despite the fact that he's the secondborn son. That would follow Genesis's pattern. It's very rarely going to be the firstborn son who actually inherits the firstborn rights in God's electoral mind. All of that for another discussion on election. Why mention Eber at the beginning of this list when he's going to naturally come up anyway? He goes out of his way to mention him, despite the fact that if he just kept going naturally, he'd come up anyways. Why? The author wants the reader to pay attention to his conclusion. So he grabs the reader's attention with mentioning Abair earlier, foreshadowing what he's about to tell you. So it's like, hey, pay attention to Ebear, because I'm about to tell you something about Ebear you're going to want to know. And, and he's going to break his pattern, repeating the names of someone very important on this list. Uh, breaking his pattern usually is, is a way of emphasizing. Set up the pattern and then break it, like saying seven sons of Japheth, seven grandsons of Japheth, seven sons of Cush, plus one, Nimrod is important by, in that counting. He's breaking a pattern there. And then go back to it by seven sons of Egypt. You know, uh, when you break the pattern, you're emphasizing something. So as he's concluding the table of 70, the book of Genesis is going to continue telling the story of God through one of Eber's sons, the one he doesn't pay attention to here, interestingly enough. The construction of the following narratives of Genesis, the rest of the book revolves around Eber's son Peleg, who gets no further details in this table. But if you're following the structure of the prologue from chapters 10 through 12, Eber, who has two sons, Peleg and Joktan. Peleg be, is named Peleg because it means divided, and the earth is divided at his time. When does the earth get divided? There's only one conclusion in all of the Bible. When it talks about God dividing the peoples, he's talking about one event that's about to come up in Genesis. What is it? Yes, uh, we, 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 when they build the Tower of Babel. And God comes down and he says, nope, we're not having that. And he makes the people spread out by, by confusing their language. 
But here, in verses 26 through 30, Joktan's sons are mentioned, and Peleg's line is ignored. Then the Tower of Babel happens, and the land is divided. And then, in Genesis 11, 10 through 26, the line of Eber's son Peleg is revisited. And it gives us the bloodline of Shem through Peleg down to Abraham and establishes the nation uh, of Israel. So the genealogies are designed to narrow the bloodline from Noah's three sons to the bloodline of Shem down to who's going to become the new representative of the seed of Genesis 3.15. Verses 21 through 31 give us 26 people groups descending from Shem. So that's 14 from Japheth, 30 from Ham, 26 from Shem. So that's 70 nations total. But if Shem is the second son, why does he come last in the list? Especially given that in chapter 9 uh, that, we've already, er, that we've already talked about, why he seems to be the highest ranking son. So if you're following this diagram, the sons of Noah, this is the way that they're, they're ordered in the table. Japheth the oldest, Ham the youngest, Shem comes last. Why would that be? Why not put Shem second, like in this diagram, and then put Hem last? Why does he end with the, the firstborn son, the highest ranking son? The author is narrowing his focus to Shem's descendants from this point on. The rest of the Bible, the rest of Genesis certainly, is going to be about Shem's descendants through a specific bloodline. Eber's son, Peleg's bloodline down to Abraham. So you get this. The Genesis narratives are constructed to narrow the focus from Shem to Eber, of Eber's two sons to Peleg, of all the sons of Peleg down to Abram, whose name is changed to Abraham and from whom the nation of Israel comes. Only one son, Shem. Only one branch of Shem's family, Eber. Only one son of Eber's line, Peleg. Only one of Peleg's descendants, Abraham. And if you skip the genealogies, you will have no clue why we're all of a sudden talking about some guy named Abraham. This is not the kind of biblical reading you can do if you're selfish or you're lazy when you open your Bible. If you're skipping genealogies because you find them boring and you refuse to spend time understanding the arguments that they're making, you are never going to understand the fullest extent of the narratives that surround them. The entire book of Ruth is written so that you get to the bloodline of David at the end. A short genealogy, like five verses like three or four generations. But the point of the book of Ruth is actually all about David. If you skip the genealogies at the end, you don't understand that. If you read the Bible only for what it has to do with you, you will skip genealogies and you will be weak and stupid in your biblical interpretation, in your Bible reading. Do you want to be weak and stupid? Do you want to be a selfish person? Do you think that's what God wants? You can express that in a microcosm of saying, I will pay attention to as much as I have the capability of paying attention to. That includes genealogy. I will pay attention to the people around me and not just my own selfish self. And you can practice that by actually not skipping the parts of the Bible that you find boring or that you find difficult to understand. If you divorce the narratives that come later just to, to, just, just to try and find moral teachings and stories, that the author is connecting back to these genealogies, say like with Nimrod in the kingdoms of Babylon and Assyria, you will miss out on the fullest extent of God's redemption when you get to places like Isaiah 30, uh, 13 and 14, where Assyria and Babylon are not the best people and are painted as God's cosmic enemies. Where Micah 5, 6, where Nimrod is mentioned through the kingdom of Assyria as being in rebellion against God. And what God is going to do about it is birth the Messiah from Bethlehem and raise up shepherds and leaders who are going to come and conquer Nimrod's kingdom. I wonder what's going on there. I wonder if Genesis 10 is cluing us in on some level. God is always doing so much more than we realize. We just have to be willing to see it. And if you're skipping genealogies, you're going to skip a lot more. Because once you give your permission, you, once you give yourself permission to skip parts of the Word of God, you are skipping parts of the Word of God that he thought was important enough to write down, record, and pass along to every generation of his people. Skipping parts of it 
over and over again, year after year, and never coming to it is a great way for you to fail at understanding the parts that you actually pay attention to. So don't do it. I go back to what I started with. You skip genealogies, I will come at you like a lion. Okay? You're going to find that Chuck's a mighty hunter in his own right. I will conquer your face if I find out you're skipping genealogies.